social justice and uh, in inclusivity and making sure that um, all voices are heard um, in, a, in a represented way. And so uh, theater companies are looking at their programming, they're looking at the types of shows that they might want to do, they're looking at um, other types of programming that may complement live performance because we don't really know exactly when we'll be able to get back into live performance in the way that we've been accustomed to. And so one of the things that we're taking a good hard look at is our source material that we traditionally and typically have gone to to create a season. To look at the, you know, the typical lineup of shows that uh, that a company might might put out there. And um, with all of those other things that I just said, one of the things that became very clear is that um, our source material in many ways is limited. And we are, we are looking at ways to encourage new voices, people that, that maybe have thought about writing, but never really jumped into that particular uh, aspect of theater. Um, maybe there are some people who have written in the past, but it's been a while and they're thinking about maybe getting back into that. But, but primarily we're, we're focused on those people out there who, who uh, just think they have some great ideas for stories and just want to get a sense of what it takes to actually sit down and write those in a theatrical format. And so, um, as we talked about that possibility, we thought, wouldn't it be wonderful to gather some wonderful creative artists from the Bay Area who, in fact, have a lot of experience doing just that, um, working with uh, new works, new works festivals that a number of theaters throughout the Bay Area uh, engage in, participate in, produce uh, on, a, on a frequent basis. And, um, and just kind of explore that whole, that whole aspect of creativity. And so um, I'm going to ask each of the people on our panel to take just a, a minute or two and uh, tell you, our audience, a little bit about themselves and their, their experience in writing for the stage, whether that's for um, adults or children or whatever that experience might be, I think you're going to hear kind of a really uh, wide range of experience coming from, from our very esteemed panel. So um, I'd like to start with uh, Melinda. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and experience with writing? Sure. Um, so I think my writing was informed by um, performing. I, I started out as an actor and I moved into directing and um, my writing experience is influenced by sort of my um, is knowledge of performance combined with uh, the wanting to use and showcase the talents of people I know in combination with um, two other interests that I have, um, my interest in academia, which is my background, like performance theory um, and performance research, and my interest in languages and in translation. Mm -hmm. So um, my experiences as a writer um, came first from uh, adaptation um, and sort of figuring out how um, I could take themes and pieces, um, you know, back when I was a teenager, sort of themes and pieces from certain uh, things that I already knew well and sort of create new narratives. And I took that into my educational career. And then I started getting really interested in language and in performance theory and um, started writing translations and found that um, as my perspective changed academically on performance theory and as I did more and more research on um, uh, you know authorship and inclusive theater and how to make inclusive theater by also including this legacy of materials um, my facility and my confidence in knowing that I didn't have to be original in order to create original material 
um, really, uh, really continued to inspire my desire to write and to experiment with my writing um, in different things, different languages, different genres, different audiences, different performers. Um, and I continue to be on that journey and I continue to learn things that hopefully will inform that journey to make me a, a better collaborator, not just a better writer. Um, so that's on that now. Okay, and obviously we'll come back to you with uh, some more specific questions about some of the things that you've been involved in. How about Thomas? Um, yeah, um, so I kind of have always written just out of a need for, I, there was no other option. Um, I remember like when I, when the first stuff I was, I wrote was actually for, um, I remember I saw the movie Atlantis when I was in like fourth grade and I was super into it for some reason. And I asked my teacher that I was in summer school with and I was like, can I make a play of this she was like okay cool so me and my friends got together and we like wrote it we got the toys from mcdonald's and we like performed it on like that um those overhead projectors with the little handle with the little shadows it was super cool i didn't have a script so i had to write my own so then and then when i started directing plays at my church i didn't have a script so i had to write my own when i wanted to direct stuff in my high school i didn't like the stuff they were offering so i wrote my own so it's always just so with me with my writing it's always been it's basically only option I had because I didn't really like the other options that were available to me or there were no other options available to me. So my writing has always kind of come out of desperation, I guess, for lack of a better word at this moment. And then it just kind of became something I was always into. I remember when I um, went to college, I one of the first classes I signed up for was a playwriting class and I really learned like the craft and the art of it. And um, Sadly, in college, um, when you're in an acting track, they like you to stay in there. So I wasn't able to take lots of those classes. But over the years um, since I graduated, I've just been able to like write stuff on my own. And the reason why I write now is more so the reason that I want to ensure that there is representation for the types of characters that a lot of artists of color actually don't get to play. So I'm like, well, instead of me complaining about it, I'm just going to change the narrative and I'm just going to write stuff for other people. Because sometimes, especially like me as a black male, there's only like five types of roles that writers that don't have my experience want to want to like put me in. So I was like, I don't like those roles. So I'm gonna write other ones that just give me a more vast variety and people like me a more vast variety of characters to play. Yeah, great. Thanks, Thomas. And we'll definitely come back to that idea uh, in a little more depth in in just a few minutes. Um, and uh, Melissa. Tell us a little bit about your background. Uh, similar to Melinda and Thomas, actually, um, it started out of need um, and also education based. Um, I taught and directed children's theater for a number of years, and I realized that um, with the grade level I was teaching, first and second grade, there was a real scarcity of children's scripts um, with content that was like engaging and simple without being simplistic and relatable and not just like a thinly veiled history lesson. Um, so I started writing like 10 to 15 minute shorts um, for kids and I ended up with a pretty big collection of that. Um, while I was teaching and directing children's theater, I was also completing my um, BA in theater at San Jose State and uh, they started doing student produced um, 40 hour play festivals. Uh, a local actor, Brian Martin, started them. And so I was in the first and second um, 40 hour play festivals as a writer and an actor um, for those. So over the years, um, I've continued with acting um, I'm a hair and makeup designer, um, and I occasionally write and direct. Um, I have not written a full-length play yet. Um, I've got a hefty collection of shorts, um, but it's like Thomas. Um, sometimes you just, you look at what's available and you're like, there's, it's not what I'm looking for. Um, it's not enough. Um, it's not the right kind of material. And so you're like, I need to create what I want to see. Um, and so you write it and I started writing a lot of adaptations um, like Melinda did. Um, I started with what I know, which is what a lot of writers do. Um, and I was adapting fairy tales and um, particularly trying to find like culturally specific fairy tales um, or ways to bring other kids into the fairy tales that were being taught in their schools that maybe weren't necessarily from their culture and finding a way to make them feel like they had a place in those narratives. Okay. And, um, and we're gonna we're gonna circle back to that uh, in a little more depth as well. And then uh, Doug, for anyone who I don't even know if it's possible that anyone doesn't know all about you, but in case there's someone out there that doesn't, 
give us a little bit about your background. Uh, I'm sure there are, no, no doubt. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I actually started writing. Uh, so I started in theater in high school, actually on the technical side. I was doing a lot of lighting design, set design and all that. And uh, there had been a tradition in my high school way before my time that people, when they had their senior directing projects, that they would also write the plays, but that hadn't happened in a long time. And so I just thought about bringing it back. And so that was the first time I wrote a play and I got hooked on it actually at that point. Um, unfortunately, while I was at Carnegie Mellon, I was there when they were quote unquote between playwriting programs for undergrads. Um, so I got to do none of that there except on my own. Um, but I took screenwriting classes and of course quickly learned the utter difference between screenwriting and stage writing because it's night and day more or less. Um, jumping ahead to getting out here, I, uh, you know, over the years I've done a mix of acting and directing and well writing actually and over the years i've had like i don't know 20 something plays either at festivals or productions or whatever around the country i've had a couple in new york uh briefly um but uh basically it's just been a back and forth amongst those various disciplines and the writing for me it, it, it it's it's hard to say it's uh i'm always interested in getting stories out there that aren't but are interesting to hear you know and sometimes that's original stuff sometimes that's uh adaptation as, as has been a common theme tonight um and uh it, it's always to me about giving people levels that they can you know access in, in what they're seeing in front of them if they want to go and just be entertained i want it to be entertaining if somebody's sitting there and they want more of the entertainment, they want to actually think, you know, then I'm hoping that there are levels in what I'm writing so that they are served as well that don't alienate the people who just want to be entertained. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's trying to serve multiple audiences at once without compromising them uh, for the sake of each other. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a nutshell, I suppose. All right, thanks. And uh, so for me, I've, I have not yet done any writing for the stage. Um, it's something that I really want to explore. I've, I've kind of kicked that idea around a lot, uh, particularly over the last several months when we're all looking for um, new ways to, to express ourselves since some of the things that we're used to doing have been kind of limited for us. Um, I have, however, been involved with uh, both directing and performing in new works, um, newly created scripts, both uh, one act type of scripts, as well as full length plays. So I directed a full length play for the Foothill College playwriting class. They had all of their uh, uh, people who were in the class wrote a play and then they each got to have their play produced uh, at, at the college so I directed one of those and that was interesting because uh, many of the people on, on our panel have talked about this process being a very collaborative one and so when you're working directly with a playwright as a director um, you, there's there's a lot of back and forth and uh, collaboration that goes into that and so I think we're going to talk a little bit uh, in more depth about that as well. Uh, and then I've directed for the uh, Tabard had, I don't know if they're still doing it, but for a number of years they did 10 in 10, which was essentially 10 short 10 minute plays. Um, and of course, uh, through Silicon Valley Shakespeare, I know that um, a similar concept is Doug, what you guys are doing there with the 48 hour festival that Melissa talked a little bit about too. And I think all of our panel has been involved in the 48 hour festival at one, at one time or another, some of you pretty extensively. So um, just a general question for, for everybody, what's it like to actually write something and then sit back and watch it being performed on stage? Um, hearing, hearing the words that you created, seeing the characters that you invented, and, and watching that uh, come to life on stage in front of you. I, 
I, I think it depends on who and where you are. And I think for me, and only for me, my hot take on this as, as the type of collaborator and also how I sort of feel about the idea of sort of creating something is that like, once it's out of your hands, like, yes, you can be in conversation, you know, if, if, if your piece is being looked, some opinion or somebody might have, you know, notes for you in process. But once that process is over, like it's a whole other entity. And I, I feel like both functionally and emotionally, at that point, I just feel so sort of detached that anything that I notice becomes very, you know, technical and, and, you know, critical, but not emotionally critical, just like any other thing. And I know that that's not everybody's process to be able to sort of div divorce yourself emotionally, but that's how I cope <laughs> with the process of collaboration. And for me, that's an essential part of the collaborative process is that once it's out, it's out. And it's never going to be what you created ever again. And that's the way it should be. Yeah, to piggyback on that, I feel great relief, actually, um, because like my hard work is done. Um, if like Melinda said, if it's a collaborative process, um, then there might be questions for clarification um, or like small refinements that you make for clarification or to suit whatever the production needs are like if you ended up casting somebody um, of a different gender than what you wrote and you can flip the gender, then you change the pronouns. Um, but once I hand it over, it's and especially with theater being like um, a uh, an impermanent art form in a way, right? You know that this production um, is going to be different from any subsequent production, and that's okay. And so when you release that baby like out into the wild, you kind of have to trust um, that 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 little dolphin's going to swim on its own, and you kind of let it go. You did your job as a parent. Um, yeah, yeah, just to double piggyback, I agree with everything they're saying. It's, um, I think for me, it's always hard because to what, what they both just said so eloquently, once you, once you hand it over, it's no longer yours. So, um, people are going to do with it what they want. They're going to think about it what, what they want. And that's an exciting thing, but that's also a really scary thing because you lose all control in that moment and you just have to sit back and just watch. So it's going to be what it's going to be, but you just have to trust that what you did is is works and it's good because a lot of the times when i've had to sit back as just a writer i'm like oh my god i hate this so much why did i write this why did no one stop me like oh my god i should have changed page six and then you're just like nope it is what it is so there's just like a there's like a nerves to it but there's also this release it's a it's a, it's a mixture of things it's it's a whole melting pot of emotions and feelings but when it's all done and when it's all said and done I think it's just relief and just excitement and wanting to move on to the next process. But, but it's, yeah, it's like letting go of a baby. And sometimes you don't want to let that baby go. And you got to, you got to give your baby up to someone else eventually. So. <laughs> I'm going to disagree with everybody. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No. Yeah. I, uh, I, I align with a lot of that. To me, the, the thing is, it's also a question of when you're seeing it though. You know, if you're going and seeing a performance, you know, uh, that's one thing. If you're going and seeing a rehearsal of it while it's in progress, that's something different. If you're actually involved in the workshopping, if it's earlier in the process, I mean, it's always different. I mean, if you're in the workshopping process, then you're there very much trying to do what, what's been described and, and trying to, you know, find things to fix, find things to improve, you know. Um, yeah, generally, I prefer to be as little involved in the actual production as possible because to me, ultimately, as we've heard, you know, once, once the thing's down on paper or on screen these days, I suppose, uh, whatever people get off the page is going to be what the play is going to be when it's out there because you're not going to be involved in a production in Wyoming or in Nebraska or wherever it is, you know, so... You want to know that people are picking up from the page what you want it to be. So you have to be able to let go to that extent. Um, to me, it's always fascinating to go and watch if, if I get to go see a rehearsal or, you know, to watch opening night or whatever, because I'm always fascinated to see what people got off the page relative to what I was hoping they would get off the page. You know, and sometimes that leads to, okay, well, that play got done there, and I'm going to go rewrite it before it gets done anywhere else because of what I saw, you know, um, and sometimes not, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it depends on, you know, where it is in the process. But to me, 
it's always educational regardless of when it is because it informs what I'll do next, whether it's working more on that thing or, uh, or on the next play that I write, you know, it's like, even when I direct a show, I tend to go to most of the performances and watch from the back because I'm studying the, uh, not studying, but I mean, I'm observing what works on different nights and how do the actors evolve things and what do they discover the third week of the run. To me, it's the same thing as a writer, you know, I'm just, I'm curious, what did the audience react to? What did they not? What did the director get from it? What did the actor get from it? You know, it's, uh, it's, it's very educational to me. All right. Well, and to kind of build on, on um, this part of the, of the um, conversation, I would, I would assume that we have a number of people in our audience who may never have done this type of writing before and are thinking about trying it. And for some of them, there may be some amount of, you know, hesitation or even fear, maybe that's a strong word, but maybe there are some people who are thinking, wow, writing is such a personal thing. And I, I'm, I'm not sure I wanna, I want, I'm not sure I will be able to put it out there for others to perhaps sit in judgment of, or to do something with that, that is different than what I had intended. And, you know, some of you, kind of talked around that concept a little bit in, in what we just uh, discussed. But maybe if you could speak to that idea of like, how can somebody gain the confidence that they need as a first time writer to put that personal creation that they have out there for the world to see and hear? Um, start with your friends or your family, people that you trust, uh, people that you, you, you know, at least you have a general idea what they probably think of you and of your, you know, your interests and, and, you know, see what they think and, um, and just like any aspect of, of theater, you know, oftentimes, especially if you're branching into writing from another part of theater, um, just bear in mind as best you can, although it is a, it can be a more personal thing, that this is, that rejection or not being right, not being somebody's right right now in terms of the work that you produce is, is okay and is not a reflection of your character, your intellect, or your creativity. It just is. It, it's the nature of producing work and the nature of, you know, um, art being subjective and that that's okay. And I would urge you not to let that discourage you from trying again and finding other audiences and other avenues to express yourself. Um, I like what Melinda said about that. Uh, you might not be somebody's right right now um, because it, it, it I feel like going into any art, there needs to be, um, you have to go into it with um, a sense of intentional vulnerability, um, knowing that the work you put out may not be the right fit um, for some people, and it may totally be the right fit for other people. And that is okay. Um, that is the nature of art, and that is part of, I think, what makes it an invitation to connect with other people's humanity, uh, what resonates with somebody now, um, and it may not resonate with them later, or it might resonate with them differently. Um, and that's totally cool, and that's why, what Melinda said about like these like circles, right? You start with your inner circle, um, you introduce your work to like your safe zone, and then you slowly broaden out from there. Um, I would recommend picking people who can give um, constructive feedback, um, right? Like, yeah, um, whose um, opinions you value, um, who are good critics, um, who are uh, discerning critics, um, but are able to couch it in a way that um, is constructive. Um, and like these 48 hour play festivals that we've mentioned, I feel like in some ways can actually be um, helpful because it gets your work out in front of an audience, but it's a relatively small group. Um, and they're going in there knowing that this was a very quick turnaround. Um, so they're more forgiving in some ways um, than like something that maybe was, you know, you had like a year to write something and it was fully produced. Um, 
I also started writing for kids um, and kids are very discerning audience members. Um, if they don't like something, they let you know right away, they stop paying attention. <laughs> um, so that like, if you get an opportunity to write for kids, even if it's just like your own nieces, nephews, brothers, sisters, um, that can also help to um, help you kind of like form your voice in a safe, I guess, hopefully safe, if, if it's within your family, safe space. Any other words of wisdom there? I kind of think they both hit it, the nail on the head perfectly. Yeah, no, I, I'll just give you one anecdote, actually, that, 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 that uh, tacks on to one of the points. Uh, yeah, the safe zone is everything. I mean, a lot of you might do theater, you know, and so get together some of your actor friends, you know, this, whoever and wherever you're going to feel safe is the thing. Um, one thing that I always like to do, actually, that somehow works against my brain well, is um, I will take the script that I've been working on for a while, and then I will, like, change the font, or I'll print it out, and I'm just, somehow that makes me looking at it fresh, like I never have before, and it gives me a new, somewhat detached perspective. It, it, it's a simple mind trick, but it actually always works on me uh, for some reason. Um, so, you know, even before anybody else sees it. Um, so you never know. Um, but the anecdote is, so the, uh, the, this ties into, I think something Melinda was saying, um, that uh, the first time I had a play done out here after I moved to California, uh, there's this theater in Santa Cruz that still does a, a bunch of new works. And uh, I had sent them three scripts uh, uh, this is a short play festival like we're talking about and I sent them a comedy and I sent them a drama and then just because it was my first time and just because I wanted to improve the odds I just threw in this other script as a total afterthought and I had to listen to the message on my answering machine yes I still had an answering machine it was 1998 uh, at, at three times because I was just convinced they chose the wrong one because they chose the afterthought and it actually got published and it got produced in New York you know, and, and it, it was the afterthought. It was not the, to this day, I still think those other two plays are better. You know, so you never, you never know what's going to resonate with people where. You never know who's going to like your style, uh, who's going to like your topicality. Um, so be you and those stars will align when they align. Okay. All right. Well, um, yeah, and and uh, I would encourage anybody in our audience who uh, may be thinking about this, but may have some of that hesitation. If uh, when we get to the Q and A part of the conversation, don't don't be afraid to bring that up, and um, you're probably not alone in the way that you're thinking about that or feeling about it right now, and um, get some good advice from from these experts. Um, so I think one of the things that a lot of people maybe, you know, feel, oh, a little bit of anxiety about is that blank page, just getting started, looking um, page. Well, that, that shows you, you know, where I am, Doug, because I used to write on a typewriter. So you had a piece of paper that was a blank piece of paper in front of you. And of course, now it's a blank screen for most, um, although I still prefer to write longhand and then, uh, and then retype. But anyway, that concept of, the, of starting, it, I'm sure it would be the same for a painter with a blank canvas when you just have that, that open space of nothing in front of you, how do you get started? Where, where does the inspiration come from for, for you guys? Where, where do you get those ideas for those stories that ultimately will fill that page or fill that screen? What I like to do is I kind of like to pull from what I know because like uh, some, someone much smarter than me said, write what you know. So I try to stick to that. So I try to stick to like, what things do I know about? What things do I find interesting? And because the likelihood is that someone else also probably thinks that thing might be interesting too and starting there. And a lot of the times, if you're just like, I don't know what to write, but I want to write, just start literally just start typing and then just seeing what happens and things will develop. And what I like to do is I like to talk to people and I like to collaborate with, um, like I've got like a mind trust of people who like 
we like bounce ideas off each other. So I like to go to them and be like, hey, I've got this, I wanna write about something. I've got this little idea. And they're like, oh, we'll try this. And I'm like, okay, that works. So I like to bounce ideas off of people. And then I also like to really take a step back and think about what do I know? And that's where I like to write, write from. Sort of similarly, um, I, uh, I, it's hard to, I was going to be like starting out, but like, I, I, I think this is still easier, um, for me because I, and, and I think I recommend if you're not sure what your voice is, um, this is something that worked for me and still continues to work for me. Um, if you're thinking about finding your voice and about finding a place to start from, find something that already exists that resonates with you emotionally. And as an exercise, rewrite it in your voice and observe what it is that you change and what it is that you're drawn to and what it is that you focus on. And for me, um, in particular, this was when I started translating and I started making a big investment in my own education in colloquial adaptation or colloquial translation. So not trying to do a word for word and instead thinking, what is the impression that I'm left with? And I know that that, that is reflective of my experience because that was where my interest grew and that was where I found the confidence through that kind of learning process to like find my own words. It was a really kind of circumspect route, but it doesn't have to be a translation. Um, because when you find your patterns and you find what you want to change and what you don't in something that you already know, you will discover things about yourself that might enable you to then be emboldened and say, you know, I wrote something. What can I do with what I wrote? How can I now turn that into something that is all me or that is, you know, more original than what I started with because of the things that I've created from this template? So start with a template. Uh, related to what Melinda said, that reminded me, I have a friend who's a songwriter and she uh, was trying to figure out how to approach covers because that was something that she wanted to learn more about herself. And she realized that it was actually um, She was like, how can I make it better? Um, how can I put my spin on it? Um, how can I make it in the image that I want to see? Um, and I think that, right, you can take, it's the uh, other side of the same coin from what Melinda's um, suggesting. Um, so in addition to what Thomas and Melinda said, um, for me, a fear of failure is actually a great motivator. Um, a lot of my writing was done because I had to write because it was either going to be performed by um, an after school um, play group of kids um, or I had literally one night to write it and I had to deliver the script at noon the next day. Um, so I don't know if anyone else like needs to work within those boundaries. I was also that kid who, when I had to write an essay, I did better work if I wrote it the night before rather than taking the like three weeks that I got from the teacher. Um, so if, if you find that you work better under pressure, maybe set some sort of deadline um, for yourself to like commit to your safe zone and say, I will get a first draft to you. We're going to get together and we're going to read it by X date and you will have something to read. Um, that's what I need to do for myself. That, that pressure of a, of a deadline helps you? Yeah, because <laughs> I'm really results driven too, right? And I don't like letting people down. So if I've committed something to someone else, then I'm more likely to follow through to it because now they're relying on me. Yeah, I, um, I, yeah, I think all of that makes a lot of sense. And I, I'll tell you, as far as the, the ideas themselves go also, because I also saw somebody was asking about that, um, they'll come from absolutely anywhere. Uh, one play that I wrote that's been done a bunch was inspired by uh, a particular melodic construction we were learning in AP music class uh, in high school uh, while we were doing Baroque music. And sometime during college, I was like, you know, that particular melodic construction seems a lot like relationships to me because it basically goes in one direction and then goes backwards. So I wrote a play about that. You know, um, one time I was seeing a play and this guy walks on stage and he's wearing his robe and these sock suspenders and an undershirt and he's looking around completely unaware of his surroundings. And somehow that image gave me the idea to write this film noir satire, but it actually was, it turned out after I, about two minutes he discovered it was a play about Alzheimer's actually originally, but it gave me that, just that image of that guy gave me that, uh, that, that idea. It can come from anywhere. Um, 
And here's the thing, don't, you, you don't have to start at the beginning. You know, uh, sometimes it can be a snippet. Sometimes you can just have this scene in mind, write it down, figure out what comes before it, what comes after it, outline around it. But the, the, the seed can be anything. Let it come from anywhere. Um, you don't have to figure everything out about these people. You can let them, you can get to know them as they get to know each other. Uh, most of the time when I write a play, I start out with, you know, it's man one, woman one, man two, whatever. They don't have names. Uh, just because they're this person, this person, I don't have to force myself into that early on. You know, it's, uh, it's, uh, or even it's just one, two, three in Roman numerals, you know, who, um, don't discover there, but don't let those kinds of things hold you back. You can go in and write pages 25 through 30 if a scene pops in your head. And then go figure out what the what came before it, and then where they go after it. Um, the biggest thing is don't feel like it's this monumental thing. Just let the idea come, and the rest of it you work on later. Yeah. So, so I want to dig into some of this a little deeper with a, a few specific questions. <clears throat> so, my first one is for Thomas. Um, Thomas, you and I had talked, you know, prior to this evening about uh, what the things that sort of compelled you to really get into writing uh, scripts, whether it be for um, stage or screen. And, um, you know, you had mentioned to me that, and in fact, you said earlier tonight that you looked around and you didn't really see stories that you wanted to be part of or characters that really resonated uh, with you. And, and as you were uh, talking to me, you, you talked about um, stories for and about black people in particular and saying that there, there really weren't enough stories about black people just living life, just, just normal everyday sort of relationship things and just just having uh, normal interactions the way that that people do you, the characters that you had come across prior to that were more stereotypical or or um, archetypal in a in a way that was not interesting to you and you used one particular phrase that that really stuck with me and, and you said there is beauty in existence and and that that is one of the things that really compels you to do a lot of your writing so uh, could you expand on that idea a little bit more and talk about um, some of the ideas for stories that you have come up with that that kind of go in line with that idea of beauty in existence. Yeah, um, I, um, one of my favorite people in Hollywood, her name is Shonda Rhimes. She is basically like the creator of like Scandal, Grey's Anatomy, those guys. When asked about how race comes into play for her, she's a black um, showrunner. Um, she said, she doesn't really think about characters race. She says, because when I wake up in the morning, I don't brush my teeth as a black woman. I brush my teeth as Shonda. And that has always rung true to me because a lot of the times with characters and plays and movies or whatever, them being black is the thing that makes them special. But when it comes to like white shows or white plays, them being white doesn't have to do with anything. So my, so my, I, so once I think it wasn't really till I was in college when I started, um, like, for example, when I would start getting scenes and stuff, they would always want them to be black scenes. I couldn't do scenes that the other kids were doing. And they always had to be about someone being black. And it always was like someone dying, someone having to like lose their brother, someone like selling drugs. And I'm just like, okay, what's the point of this? What are you trying to tell me about what you think I can do as an actor? So then I was like, okay, this is a problem for me. So then I really started looking into it. And I thought, I was like, well, it can't just be this school. Then I started looking at what's a representation in TV. And then I, then I started branching out my experience in like shows I watch. And I was like, this isn't just a, thing that some people think. This is like a mindset that is across the board that people think. So when I write, I try to write for black people or just anyone just existing where that, in particular the last couple of things I've written, it's just about just black people just existing because like we're happy. We have other things, Not our, our lives aren't just miserable. We're not just trying to make money. We're not dealing with the fact that our cousin died, which is all that you see in a lot of these black 
in a lot of these plays that are often done. There is so many beautiful Black stories about just Black people just existing. And especially right now, it's so important because all you see on the news is Black suffering. So we as artists, we have to do it. We have to do the, we have to show the opposite. Not to say that the Black suffering isn't important to see because that is huge. But we also have to show that there's other things as well. And I think that, and it's not going to be something that happens overnight. And it's got to be something that we all, come to a mindset and we have to agree that there's something wrong with that. And right now I don't know if everyone's at that point. Does that make sense? Um, sure. So let me follow up on that a little bit. If you know, you had said, and, and certainly rightly so that stories that are written at what people perceive to be typically stories about white people, the, their their color, their race is unimportant in those stories. They're, it's not a story about white people, it's just a story. Mm -hmm. And so how, how can a writer ensure that what they write is able to be uh, portrayed without having to focus on the color of the person who's who's portraying that character does that make sense yeah no so i think a lot of the times as a writer i wonder though if as a writer do you always go in saying that this person has to be a blonde five foot two white woman or is that an issue on the other side with the casting and the companies because if i as a writer a lot of the times there, my stuff is race specific, but there's other times where it's like, I don't care who does it. It just has to be a person. So what happens, I think is, and this is going to step out of the writing realm a little bit, it's all about who gets cast and what's that portrayed as. Does that make sense? Because I think a lot of the times, I don't necessarily think when people write, they write with a specific race in mind, unless that's what you're doing. Does that make sense? So I think yeah. that's, a, that's even bigger conversation that we have to have. And I think <laughs> we need a whole nother panel discussion about that. <laughs> Right, but I do see a lot of heads Not nodding. A little bit. Yeah, Melinda, what, what do you think about all that? Well, I mean, I, 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 what I said was, I think we can talk about it a little bit because ultimately representation is everybody's responsibility, particularly those who benefit from the type of representation that we primarily have now, which is colorblind casting at best mm -hmm. in the majority of theaters mm -hmm. and colorblind casting at best. I mean, all I have to say about this is, you know, I think a lot of us have, have talked about the fear of rejection as writers. And I think that the fear of rejection as it extends into a broader conversation about theater is that I feel that those who I, I have seen and you know, even the best, you know, in allyship, people who who are trying to push forward um, inclusivity in a responsible way by dismantling their own privilege, sometimes still get that little hitch when they realize that they're going to lose out on opportunity. Let it go and allow yourself in the theatrical community to step aside and support any theater practitioner, any playwright, any performer, any producer who is actively giving opportunities, not just colorblind at best, but promoting and inviting actors of color and actors of difference to create art that, that may mean that your privilege is brought into question because ultimately ending, ending the stigma of privilege is like the least that we can do to create inclusive theater. Um, and I think it is part of any conversation and it should be part of any conversation. Um, not only a conversation from those who, who would benefit extraordinarily from that at a minimum, but those who need to step aside and acknowledge that to be an ally means to willingly uh, set aside your fear of rejection and promote opportunities for the people. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Um, Melissa, w when you and I had talked previous, previously, 
a bit about it tonight, the focus that you have had uh, in a lot of your writing that was for children and both writing for and directing youth theater. And um, you, you talked about some very interesting approaches that you use to kind of address the need for cultural diversity in, in and among youth groups, whether it's in a school or outside of a school. So can you, can you talk a little bit about some of the ways that you have found success in, you know, kind of making theater accessible and engaging for kids um, who are coming from something other than that Anglo Western heritage, you know, as you, as you either write stories, adapting stories, or um, get them to participate in that creative process as well to, to make sure that, um, that it is an inclusive experience. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I'll preface this by saying that for me, inclusivity, like Melinda touched on, is it goes beyond just um, like colorhood, but also differing abilities, um, right? Uh, disabilities. Um, so it, it stretches beyond. Um, and I think that something that helps anybody um, is, is the work relatable to them in some way. Um, and particularly for kids who maybe if this is their first or one of their first times um, experiencing theater as a theater maker, um, it really helps if it's something they're familiar with. And so when I was teaching, I tried adapting fairy tales, of course, um, but I would always try to sneak in or stick in um, something that was maybe a culturally specific um, fairy tale or folk tale that uh, they might know from, say, home, like maybe their grandparents were telling them these stories, but weren't necessarily taught in schools. Like here, you know, we're taught the Snow White stories and Goldilocks and the Three Little Bears and how is Goldilocks always portrayed? It's in her name, she's got blonde hair, right? Um, so she's most likely a little white girl. Um, but how can we turn that on its head, um, take like a fractured fairy tale, uh, uh, you know, take to it in some way, like twist it um, and make it relevant to kids um, who maybe have not historically seen themselves reflected in those stories. Um, or take a story, like if you go into a community um, that has a high population um, from a certain culture, um, can you find out what are some common folk tales um, or folklores or even just like some archetypes um, common to that culture and then um, adapt a story based on that? Um, that helps kids because if they're familiar with the story, um, it gets them engaged and interested. Um, it kind of shortcuts the process um, and they can get excited about it because it's something that they can see themselves truly reflected in. Um, and my hope is that they grow to learn that a lot of those boundaries are imposed by people, which means that people themselves can break down those boundaries. Can you just for the benefit of our audience, can you think of an example of, of one of those children's stories that either you adapted or created based on, um, you know, something that was relatable to to uh, an underrepresented group or, uh, you know, a differently abled group or something like that? Yeah, um, when I was a kid, uh, I found a book of Japanese folk tales, and I'm not Japanese, but I, you know, it was still Asian, right? And my options as a kid for finding in the library, like stories of Asian folk tales was fairly limited. Um, and so there was one in there about um, a villager who uh, he, he basically, it was essentially, he had a clay pot that would keep um, refilling itself. Um, he, if he like left fish in there overnight, it would be overflowing with fish the next morning. If he left a gold coin in there, it would be overflowing um, with money overnight. And so I adapted um, that story um, for um, a community that had a lot of Asians um, in it. Um, I just thought of another story that I've now, for, oh, oh, uh, the, um, there's another one, um, the, the Five Chinese Brothers, which is a picture book. Um, that is about five brothers with each with a different superpower. Um, basically, like one can hold as, drink in as much water um, as like he wants and he can hold it even if it's the ocean. Um, one is super strong, things like that. And so um, the, because those all started in books, um, that was really easy um, to help the kids like adapt that um, because um, they started as picture books. And so even if the kids, maybe if um, English was their second language or their reading level wasn't up to it, there were still pictures to help them understand the story that was happening. And then those pictures also translated to um, blocking on stage when we got to putting it up on its feet. Okay, thanks. Um, 
so uh, Melinda, I had a, a question for you uh, in the conversation that you and I had prior to tonight. One of the really interesting things that, that um, you talked a lot about was the idea of limitations leading to new and creative solutions. And I think, you know, right now in the time of COVID and um, who knows what live theater is going to really look like for a while into the future, um, it, it may not return to what we have, you know, traditionally experienced and, and come to know. And so can you talk a little bit about uh, some of the examples that, that you have where you ex experienced a limitation and that led you into writing something that addressed that through a, a creative way? Uh, sure. So I think like a lot of people on this panel and, and possibly a lot of people who, you know, are, are practitioners or writers, um, you know, in, in the audience right now, um, I think um, a lot of us has sort of written under duress and a lot of us have worked, you know, in theater for a lot of small companies or, you know, sort of made, made our, our lot of dollars out of a lot of, you know, two bit pieces. But I think um, when I started, when I started writing, I think I just generally think small anyway. Um, and that can mean a small cast. Um, if you're, you know, thinking, of, you know, if you're writing with, you know, wanting feedback in mind, it can mean a small cast. Um, I've written pieces before where, you know, like a lot of us who have written for festivals and I've written for festivals where the cast list is very small. So in that case, it can be freeing to know, okay, I only have four characters and they're only gonna have this finite amount of time to do and say whatever. So I need to write to the advantage of four characters in one room, you know, it, with, you know, a big action happening you know, having seven minutes in or, you know, well, we only have, you know, two chairs, you know, we've, I think we've written under similar circumstances. Um, so a lot of the writing that I've done that, that I knew was going to be produced, um, not that I was, you know, sending out to anybody else, but that I knew that I was writing for a festival, generally that kind of turnaround um, is, is, it, it sort of fulfills that expectation of, of not having a lot. And I think a lot of people on this panel can identify with that. And then beyond that, when I've worked at festivals as a director, um, a lot of times, you know, if you have a fully staged piece or a fully realized piece, one way that you can work with a playwright as a director or with a director as a playwright is being really selective about how you show or demonstrate something, even if you have a big cast or you have a show that is sort of fully blocked or where you want the audience to imagine something, but you don't have the means to display all of it. You know, really being deliberate and careful as a playwright who is submitting work to be workshopped or read for the first time in a way that shows the audience the most sort of important, important elements that you want to show so that they can give feedback and so the director and the actors can give meaningful feedback to those moments without having to say to yourself, oh, well, if I don't have all this, if I can't have this fully produced piece, my play won't be good. Um, it won't be enough because um, it will. And so finding sort of the highlights and the bits that you can show without showing a lot. And then um, the, the last quick thing I'll say is, um, educationally as well, I, I went to, to grad school and the program that I was in dealt specifically with um, what's called original performance style, um, which is an early modern, uh, early modern model. So we exclusively had to do, there were 11 of us. We had to produce a full season of shows um, with uh, $10,000 for the season and uh, we were restricted to an early modern style. So that meant no tech and that meant um, open space theater. And, you know, that came pretty far at the end of the work that I had already been doing only in the past couple of years, but that only reinforced for me that even something that is fully realized um, can be innovated, however large or small your resources 
provide and thinking resources first, materials second, just remember that your piece and your vision are the materials that you need in order to put the vision forward and anything else is just gravy and you may find that you prefer it without, you know, it just depends. Can I tie on to that just really quickly? Yeah. The yeah. idea of you are enough, right? Your work is enough. The other stuff, like she said, is gravy, um, but you with your work are enough. And um, again, I, I mentioned that I had done some directing and also performing in some New Works festivals in the past. And often what I came away with was that some of the playwrights were making things overly complex. There were, they were creating situations that, you know, were just very, very uh, complicated and lots of, to me, extraneous stuff going on in, in some of those plays. So, you know, kind of a general question for the panel, when you write, how do, are you being conscious of simplicity and minimalism, being able to say and convey what, what you're trying to get across in as few words as possible or in, you know, in, a, in a setting that doesn't detract from the relationships that you're trying to create among your characters? Yes. <laughs> awesome <laughs> yeah I always feel like the best plays can be done in a barn or on a Broadway stage so at the end of the day it has to be about a good play if you name some of your best plays some of the plays that we all love I think that it comes down to do characters connect and is a story something that you can connect with and if you write that you're butter so that's basically my opinion of it, it doesn't it shouldn't really matter like Melinda said everything else is gravy the script itself has got to be able to work in wherever, whatever format you can put it in. Yeah, and just to tack on to that, I mean, I don't want to keep harping on this one example, but it's like uh, that first play that I had done down in Santa Cruz in 99, I think it was performed. Um, it was a totally minimalist piece and they did it that way. Um, it was done in New York three years later and they desimplified it. They added stuff to it. They didn't trust the simplicity of it. And without saying it too loud, I thought the Santa Cruz production was actually better. So, you know, simplicity, yay. <laughs> well, and, you know, right now, many theater companies, including SBMT, is doing a lot of exploration of this theater in the Zoom world. And so you're very limited in what you can, what you can have on that screen at any one time. And, you know, some people... Uh, get creative with some costuming and some and some backgrounds and stuff like that but but you're really focused on the words you're you're focused on you know the interaction among the characters and not the spectacle that we've come to um, expect from a lot of uh, you know professional theater companies that really um, go over the top with the tech and the, and uh, some of those aspects of theater that while they certainly can be very entertaining, it's, I, I like what Thomas said, your, your play should be able to, to be done in a barn or in a black box or, you know, and of course that's generalizing and there certainly are those shows that are all about spectacle and we like those sometimes, but for our new writers, the, the people who are just getting started with this process, um, I think we, I, I think there is value in encouraging people to think in a, in a simpler way and, and not try to overly complicate the, the settings and the situations and the number of characters and, uh, you know, an envisioned tech situation that m may not be possible in an online virtual kind of theater or perhaps some theaters will move more to open space an outdoor kind of experience where again tech may be limited and uh, so I, I think that's something that 
is, is good advice for everybody who's going to jump into this. Um, and along those lines, uh, I wanted to ask the panel generally, thinking back to certainly when you first got started writing, but you know, even as an experienced writer, I'm sure that you are all learning every time you sit down to write something or see something of yours being uh, performed. So I was just wondering if you could relay to us you know, some lessons learned as, as you went through the process and uh, got, that, got that valuable early experience and feedback from other people that you trusted on, on your, your writing, your writing process, how you created characters, how you created uh, your, your stories. What are, what are some of the lessons that you learned as you, as you learned more about this craft? I think my, my biggest lesson, something I'm still dealing with, is rewriting is your best friend and do not be afraid of it. A lot of the times we wanna like write and we're so proud, we're like, oh, this is it, this is dope. And then you give it to someone, then they send you back a thousand edits and you're like, what the hell, this is the best thing I've ever given you. And then you have to realize that you're like, oh, okay, cool. So then you go back again and then it's the same process over and over again. So you can't be afraid of rewriting and you can't be afraid of feedback because those are gonna be the things that really help you elevate to what, to what is going to make the thing the best. Because theater at its art is about collaboration. And if you do it by yourself, what's the point? So it's all about bringing in those trusted people and getting that feedback and don't being afraid to incorporate that feedback and take another stab at it. It doesn't mean what you did doesn't work. It's just all about how do you elevate it and make it better than what it is before? Because I think that's what we all want. Coming at it from like an actor background, um, I also try to write dialogue that I would want to say that I would be comfortable saying. Um, sometimes I will read scripts and like sometimes they're from playwrights who are established, right? Um, and like well-known and the words just aren't comfortable for me with my style. And I'm like, okay, they work again. This is like, it's not my right right now. Um, I try to write words, dialogue that fits naturally for me. Um, related to that too, um, I mentioned this to Diane when we were talking earlier. Um, I'm really pedantic about my punctuation. I'm really specific about it um, when I, as a writer, um, because like to me as an actor, um, I treat, um, I deliver a, like a, a dash differently than I do an ellipses, different than a semicolon versus a period. Um, and so I write with that specificity. Um, and I, I think that helps with actor clarity in terms of understanding my intent. They might choose to ignore that, that's fine, um, but it helps them understand what I was um, trying to go for. Yeah, I, I would also, I, I think this is advice that's been reflected throughout the panel, which is that, you know, um, so I'll just reiterate it, I guess. But like, I think, you know, it's okay to give yourself deadlines um, if it keeps you productive. It's also okay for something to take a long time. There's stuff that I've written in two hours that was performed um, that was just fine. And there's something that I've been working on for eight years. And the good thing about that is that I can go back and it can develop and germinate, you know, and, and I can workshop pieces of it if I have the fortune to do that. But just because something's not finished or it's not finished in the time that you thought doesn't mean it sort of times out of, of, the, of its uh, worthiness to sort of be worked on. So I think, you know, encourage yourself however you can, but, you know, go back and, and review things that you've written or, you know, go back and, you know, it's never too late to pick something up again and to refine it. And if you've changed, uh, you know, change your, change your piece. You know what I mean? It's, that's okay. Um, because ultimately if you go on to give it to somebody else, it's going to change again and again and again. And that's, uh, that's, that's great. Um, Diane, pardon the interruption. We do have one question that's along these same sort of lines. Um, and this comes from one of our uh, um, listeners. Um, when submitting, a, from Diane, from when submitting a play to be accepted for, for performance, I assume my script will only be read once. I'd like to know if the writers here think about adding uh, directions, whether as stage directions or an emphasis on certain words in the dialogue so that the play doesn't seem so dead to a reader when submitting. So 
Yeah, I, I saw that question. I think that's an excellent question. Um, uh, I actually was on the Theater Works uh, New Play Reading Committee for a bunch of years the past decade. Um, and uh, we read tons of play. We read tons of plays. Um, and people get it pretty quickly when they're exposed to that many new works. They know what they're looking for. Uh, well, I mean, you can't say this. Every theater is going to be different, of course, I guess. But they they read a lot of plays and so i'm not going to say that they'll get every nuance out of a out of a, a single read that's possible to be gotten but they'll get more than you expect um one general thing i think that everybody there always felt was don't give me too many directions to read um give, give enough textual let the care because the dialogue is what the audience is going to get the stage directions just describe stuff that may or may not happen to embellish it um you know and if there's lines in there that uh you know really need to come a certain way because if they're delivered a certain other way that seems obvious from the wording put it in there and send tell it because you know that that, that kind of clarifying is good but don't overdo it um it's hard to find that balance um but again when people read it for you before you send it off then you can get that kind of feedback and then it'll help. Um, but yeah, I would say it's good to have some of it in there. Personally, I'm mean, as, as a director, even I'm not one of those people that will, you know, be like, okay, anything in italics, I'm just ignoring. I'm not one of those. So I'm coming from that perspective, but yeah, I would not uh, do them too much because the scripts that always were harder for me to get through in the, in the for the new work stuff was the ones that were like Tennessee Williams. Um, it just was such a slog to read through and it, it made the dialogue have to be that much more engaging to compensate for how much stage direction I was reading. Okay, so um, Doug, I, I want to give you a little opportunity to help us understand. So, so we're having this panel discussion on this process of writing for the theater, writing for the stage. And our ultimate goal here um, through SBMT is to do a, a practical workshop series in the fall where people can actually do some writing. And the goal of that series is to write something in the neighborhood of a five to 10 minute short, or it, you can think of it as a scene or a one act or, you know, however, however it turns out, but somewhere uh, in the neighborhood of like five to 10 minutes worth of dialogue. And so, um, Doug, can you talk a little bit about that workshop series that we're um, planning for the fall and what people can expect if they, if they sign up for that and if they uh, choose to participate in that series? Absolutely. So the general idea is uh, exactly as what Diane described. I'd say that we'll probably cater it a little bit towards, you know, who signs up, you know, in terms of uh, is it people who, is, is it a bunch of people who have acted but never written? Is it people who have never done anything in theater except for watch, you know? Uh, so we cater it a bit like that. But the general structure of it would be that it would be like four sessions we're talking about at this point, I think. And uh, the first one would be a discussion to get familiar with the tools, um, to get familiar with uh, you know, the, the basic structure of a, of a scene or of a play. Um, and uh, to, 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 you know, to, to get all the, 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 the fundamentals in place so that you don't have to worry about, ooh, how am I supposed to format this? Oh, what am I supposed to write it in? How is it supposed to look? All that kind of thing. Just getting the tools established um, so that you know basically what you're working in to be able to bring your ideas. Then it's also going to encourage ways to find a few ideas to write, okay? Um, then the idea is to come back and share what the ideas are and hone it down to one that you'll write and then go back and do some writing, bring it in. We have people read it out loud, much like uh, I've been in a few playwright groups over the years uh, uh, and actually offhand, the Pair uh, Theater uh, uh, Writers Guild is very much like this, uh, where basically you bring in 10 pages and uh, other people in the room read it out loud and then everybody offers their constructive 
uh, comments to help and you go back and rewrite. So we would do a couple of iterations of that um, and uh, ultimately have something where you'll have, uh, as Thomas says, you'll have done some rewriting already um, and, and hopefully recognize the invaluable nature of it. Um, and that's after having come away with a fundamental understanding of the basics, the structure, you know, beginning, middle, end, uh, character arc, thinking about, you know, where were they before the scene started? Where are they going after the scene started? You know, that kind of a thing. Um, and uh, how to come up with ideas, how to find things that matter to you and seeing it come out on paper. And uh, it, it, gives you, it gives you a foot in the door. It, gives, it gets your toes wet. Um, and hopefully it would lead to being able to do more things. Um, the one thing I will say is that it's a piece, probably for most people, I'm guessing, uh, an early piece in the evolutionary process of writing insofar as I, well, I can't speak for anybody else on the panel, but I would suspect that uh, everybody would say that uh, how they approach writing has evolved a whole lot from how they started. So what you would do in these sessions isn't exactly what you would be doing on play number 15. You know, uh, sometimes I go back and look at some of the early stuff that I did. And I'm like, what was I thinking? You know, or how did I even approach that? And I'm like, oh, wow. I Yeah, that's changed. So it's, it's an evolutionary step to help give people the means to be able to bring your stuff to the world. In a nutshell. All right. So um, we have a little bit of time for some audience questions. So Sarah, if you've been... Uh, Tracking that for us, any, any questions for the panel from our viewers? Yes, I certainly do. We have a couple, um, and some of them have been touched upon already. Uh, but Christina asked, has anybody written a musical or play with music? And if so, how is that different for you than writing straight plays? Has anybody else? Okay. Um, I have not much that's gotten out there, but if you, short form things here and there. Um, but uh, fundamentally, it's uh, it, different people will talk about different approaches for this kind of thing. But fundamentally, I follow the approach of I, I approach the book first. Um, in, in my case, I've tended to write the book and the songs. Um, that's not always the case. Uh, and look at it in a lot of the musicals you've seen, that's not the case. Um, there'll be two or three different people there. Um, but uh, I tend to write the book and then look at scenes for opportunities for songs. Uh, songs fundamentally help to advance the story. Uh, and that's probably one of the most important things. Um, there's a lot of times where people will write, somebody will write the book for the show and then the, uh, the the composer the lyricist will come in and they will look for opportunities for song in the scenes that are already written sometimes that happens just at the outline phase actually before all the dialogue is even there and be like okay this is an important thing where we need a song here that's going on for this and there are some fundamental things like you know the i want song uh, for example, that always is there early in a show. Like if you're talking Fiddler on the Roof, it's if I were a rich man, it's what he wants. You know, go look at almost any musical, you're going to find that song in Brown Act 1, Scene 2. Um, and, uh, but it's a different creature insofar as you're finding musical opportunities and they can affect the rhythm of the show, the pacing of the show. Um, you got to make sure there aren't too many of them. Uh, and honestly, at times I have found that having the music there helps with the story arc because every now and then I've been like, wait a minute, there's no reprise of anything in the second act that happened in the first act. And reprises are usually a wonderful touch point for either approaching closure of a major story arc or, 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 or you know, throwing it on its ear, you know, uh, having a major turning point. Um, and so sometimes when you're going through that with the music and you realize you don't have any of those is because your story doesn't either. So your story itself needs some work. Um, so it makes it a bit of a different creature. It's, it's an additional tool. It's the music is an additional tool. Um, and it brings its own challenges too. Thank you. Um, doll had a question. Um, once you have your work written, how do you get it out there? Well, um, there are a lot of places in the Bay area, um, if you just want, if you're okay with people hearing you, your work that aren't necessarily uh, friends or family, if you're past that point, 
Um, there are uh, there are places in the Bay Area like Dragon Productions, for example, is one that is Aval doing a ton of online content, um, an absolute ton. But they also have uh, slots throughout the week. They're sort of a community organization. Um, they have slots and events throughout their week, um, even you know when you know the the brick and mortar theater is sort of back in biz where they sort of invite the community in to do showcases. So occasionally there is a wait, but if you are sort of in a, in a transitional period between wanting to sort of submit to the festival, kind of want this sort of in-between, you can um, submit the work to places uh, like that. But if you're sort of past that point, um, there are a lot of um, email groups and Facebook groups um, for playwrights uh, specific to the Bay Area. I'm of course blanking, but I, if I find resources, I'll, I'll put them in the chat. Um, but there are just like um, sort of festival um, and playwriting sort of submission chains that you can join that will let you know when there are playwriting opportunities or play submission opportunities. Uh, all over the United States or internationally. And I know a lot of Bay Area based playwrights who have grown uh, uh, in prolificity enormously over the past few years because they have really stuck with that kind of submission process. Um, so it sort of enables you to submit, you know, works that you have of all different kinds or all different kinds of festivals that are looking for submissions and different types of works. So it you know, if you're willing to sort of invest the time and sort of set yourself up for the fact that that is going to mean like potentially an overwhelming amount of rejection, it does allow you to be flexible in, in what, how, what and how you submit without necessarily having to, you know, feel like you need to be asked or be invited. Um, so again, I know I'm being vague. It's not my intention. I'm just <laughs> feeling the pressure of having answers, but there are, uh, Facebook groups and there are online collectives um, that accept submissions on a really, really frequent basis. Um, City Lights also has a new works festival every year. Uh, the Pair does as well. In fact, I think actually the Pair has two um, um, opportunities. They've got um, like an incubator program um, where they help develop the work and then they've got one that actually produces selected works. So it's a, a double staged <laughs> no pun intended, process um, that can help like develop works. Um, and then um, I'm blanking. I feel like there's another company too that produces new works. Yeah, Kyle also asked in the chat, um, what are other places that have new works? So we did we did list a couple of those, the Pear being one, um, yeah, Dragon Theater being an excellent one. So in the chat, I also put uh, Z Space up in San Francisco. There's the Playwrights Foundation, uh, Ross Valley Player and Actors Theater in Santa Cruz or some places. Um, that all kind of do new works as well. Um, if you're, in, yeah, and, and uh, I just thought of this, at least there's one name that I thought of. If you're interested in the idea, you know, if deadlines and writing on a theme appeals to you, um, uh, the Olympians Festival based out of San Francisco um, is a festival that accepts new works um, on a mythological theme, but within that there's a lot of diversity. They produce, you know, uh, dozens of pieces a year of all different lengths. The festival is one point, but like the work that they look for, they look for full lengths, they look for shorts, they look for one acts. And um, they, it is, while it is competitive in that they uh, accept, uh, they don't accept everything, but they accept by pitch. So you don't have to have something written before you get accepted to the festival. All you have to have is your pitch on a theme. So if that's something that appeals to you, um, it's a huge community um, participation and engages a lot of the Bay Area community as actors, directors, and playwrights. And so that may also be something appealing to people who are trying to experiment with style or you know, uh, maintain that kind of pressure to, to produce something um, on, a, on a tight deadline. Yeah. Two other things I'll mention real quick. One is actually with Silicon Valley Shakespeare, because I've got a shill at some point tonight, right? Um, we have a 48-hour festival every year, um, and this year it's certainly going to be online. Um, and we're actually having some initial conversations about possibly even 
expanding that to maybe even do more than one, for example. So there's always a possibility of that, um, though I said too much already. Um, the other thing I was going to mention is if you want to move beyond local uh, on the national scene, uh, there's a ton of places that will take submissions, ways to find out about them. Again, there are Facebook groups, there are email lists. One in particular is called Playwright Binge. It's an email list out there that's got thousands of writers on it. Don't let that intimidate you. Um, but people will post opportunities that they find out about constantly. A lot, a lot of them are very specialized for different demographics or different, you know, play types or topic matters or what have you. Um, but there's a bunch uh, that happens there. Also, if you've had even just one show done in a production anywhere, you can join the Dramatist Guild um, and they have a ton of opportunities that they you know, list off as well. You can find out about through them as well. Um, so uh, that's more on a national uh, scene, but uh, those are definitely ways to do it. And the funny thing is a lot of writers over the years I have found find a lot of their success just from people that they get to know or theaters that they get to know. And usually that's a local thing. Um, that doesn't mean, oh my God, I have to have connections. It, it, it should, it's not as intimidating as that. Um, Cold calls are harder. Um, it, it's as true in playwriting as, as in Glengarry Glen Ross, uh, uh, for any Mammoth fans out there. Um, but uh, I got lucky actually myself because I did not do much with, you know, knowing anybody or to, you're trying to connect with anybody out here for I think the first eight or nine years, actually. I was just submitting to uh, calls for plays at various theaters around the country. Um, and I got lucky actually numerous times um, and I say that not because of anything except for, if it can happen to me, it can happen to you. So there is value in those as well. Um, on the other hand, I would say that everything Melinda uh, pointed out in particular are wonderful opportunities that are nearby, which has its efficacies. And just on a side note too, um, uh, Jessica mentioned Lauren Gunderson in the chat, who is a local author and had no idea. I've been following her recently on Facebook and she's been doing a lot of weekly um, uh, chats uh, through Facebook that have been fascinating to listen to about the whole process of writing itself. So there's, there's ample um, uh, opportunities out in, that, in, the, in the interwebs so kind of our next question is a biggie, um, you guys, and it's kind of the one that, that looms over every theater in the country right now is what is the future of live theater? And um, tied in with that is, this is a question from My Miles, and then Evelyn asks too, has anyone started on writing specifically for the new digital theater space and how is that coming along? So it's, it's this grandiose kind of topic. We're doing so much of this interactive Zoom. How is that? What's the future there? What do you guys think? And then um, is uh, thoughts about writing specifically for, an, uh, for a virtual online platform? Um, I have written stuff for a virtual platform and I not only wrote but I participated in it was the short form sketches but they were pretty much written um, I think in May and um, they were you know pretty specific to like oh and this one takes place in a zoom meeting or like oh well the premise of this is you know uh, that you know these two people you know doing this you know everyday thing but it's zoom and I I know, or I was aware as I was saying that, that my tone was a little, I don't know. I, I'm not, it's, I don't mean to be judgy at all. I just think my, I, I have done it. And what I hope for myself and for others who are going to spend the next year, not only trying to sort of innovate what already exists for this medium, but are writing in ways that, showcase this medium in new and creative ways what I hope is that that stuff that is written for this medium and for these circumstances can be expanded and manipulated and adapted back sort of out of this containment and I don't think that it can't be but I'm just sort of I'm eager as as thrilled that I am that it is happening I find myself in the moment more eager to see how that's going to be sort of accordioned back 
out again, then, then I am sort of invested in, you know, uh, finding those ways to contain. Because I think treating everything like a, a, a reading um, or treating everything, you know, in this contained way, um, I think it is interesting. And I think it's interesting that we continue to make theater this way. Um, and I think it's just gonna, and I think and hope that it's going to generate a lot of sort of difference in creativity when uh, this is over, regardless of what over means um, and when it happens. Yeah, I guess I, um, I uh, Sarah and I, we could probably do a whole other panel of executive directors, you know, talking about future theater. And I mean, you know, it's like, you know, pick your magic eight ball, you know, it's, it's, it's a hard, hard question. And uh, anybody who has an answer right now is a speculative answer that's probably going to change by the time we get to that future. Um, and it's going to evolve and uh, how it's going to accordion out is now my new favorite saying about that. Um, I think that's brilliant. Uh, I, uh, I, I think fundamentally, though, you know, back onto our, you know, topic for the night, you know, in relation to that, Playwriting has been around for hundreds of years, and fundamentally, it has been about characters, scenes, story arc. All of those are constants, and so I think those are going to continue to underlie whatever this becomes. They might manifest in different ways, um, you know, without going into the history of theater, you know, there's been a lot of changes over time, not just technological ones, but stylistic ones, you know, even the introduction of the musical. Um, but, you know, I'm gonna stop before I get professorial here. Um, but the big thing is, I think the fundamental tools are gonna be similar, it's just how you implement them. Um, and uh, one of the things we're going to touch on, actually, in these upcoming workshops, to shill again, is uh, we're you know we're going to talk about online because imminently that's probably where your audience is going to be. Um, so we'll talk about that. And I have been not having an extensive amount of time lately for various reasons to actually write too much directly new for it myself yet. Um, but one thing I can say is that uh, last month we actually did a play of mine, it was like an hour long play. It actually about 10 years ago had been done in, uh, in readings a couple times live in different places. And so we did an online lie, an online reading of it uh, this past month. And it was fascinating to see the differences, but mostly it was fascinating to see the lack of differences. Um, we cut a few bits that were purely physical comedy or were particularly prop heavy. Uh, you know, from it, but I was actually surprised about the number of things, the actors and Melissa and Thomas were actually in it. Um, and I was surprised and impressed by how many things they were able to just bring into it or do something minimalist that was equivalent to make it work. Um, and it didn't really require changing the writing at all for those things. Um, and the, you know, and the response and the feedback and all that was just as strong as it had been for the in-person stuff. Um, so, there are things, but I think that the fundamentals, you know, minimalism is something we were talking about earlier. That's obviously something you got to do online. But if you're already writing toward that anyway, it's a relatively easy jump to take. Um, and if you're starting from it from scratch, I think that's the place to go from and, you know, see how far you can build on top of it if you want to, but you might not even need to so much um, for what it's worth. The one other thing I'll mention is that some things just play differently because, you know, in person, three dimensional people seeing, hearing their breathing is different than what we have here. Um, fundamentally, the euphemism has always been that the difference between screenwriting and stage writing is that in screenwriting you show and in stage writing you tell. Um, and while, frankly, a lot of technology for the stage has made it more possible to show, like the spectacle, um, still fundamentally that's true. And I think that that is actually gonna be an interesting area that's gonna evolve while we're doing this online stuff because we're not shifting the writing away to showing because we're not gonna sit here and do Zoom plays that are going to be the equivalent of something coming out of Hollywood. It's going to be its own separate thing um, that just happens to have a technological similarity to it. But I think, again, it's gonna rely on character, it's gonna rely on story development, structure, uh, even with all that. Okay, that was a little professorial, sorry. So um, I, I, we've kind of run out of time at this point. Sarah, have we hit um, most of the questions that have come in? 
sorry, most of the questions have been answered. I don't think there was anything too major. Okay, great. So um, I'd like to take this opportunity to once again thank our panel. I know Thomas had to leave. He had another commitment that uh, uh, he needed to run off to, but I want to uh, put my thanks out to him as well as Melissa and Melinda and uh, of course Doug, who will be carrying this forward with us as we as we look to uh, to uh, launch the the workshop series. And so, and of course, we want to thank our audience for joining us tonight. Thank you all for your interest in this topic, and I, we hope to see uh, many of you in the in the workshop series that we're going to do in the fall. Uh, most likely, it will start around mid October, and uh, we'll get some details. Uh, in fact, Sarah is just posting now a link to uh, a little bit more information on that workshop series. And so I'd like to end with uh, our panel. If you have any final words of encouragement or, uh, you know, some, some tips for our, our would-be writers, people who are, are getting ready to, uh, to take that leap, anything that you'd like to say as some parting words for them? This, I mean, this is really simplistic, but simplistic is not bad. I mean, Anything is something. Um, something doesn't have to be everything. It, it just has to be whatever it is. And that has kept me going a lot of times. <laughs> a lot of times where I felt, you know, stuck um, over the years. Um, it hasn't stopped me from feeling stuck, but it has helped me to get unstuck when I really needed to. So, you know. Uh, I, I wish everybody luck if this is something they want to do, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to chat. Um, I guess I'll say if you have something in you that wants out creatively, let it out. Don't let fear of judgment um, or self-judgment in particular, right, be that barrier. Um, open it up and let it through the barrier. Yeah, fundamentally, that's the big thing. Um, don't be an obstacle to yourself. Don't hold yourself back. Don't let the belief that, oh, but I didn't do this, or oh, maybe that, or oh, this could be this, oh, I'm not sure. Don't let any of that get in the way. Just, you know, try something. If it works, great. If it doesn't, you can fix it. There's always a delete key. There's even liquid paper, but it might ruin your monitor. Awesome. Uh, okay, well, thanks again, everyone. Thanks to Sarah and the gang at SBMT for um, allowing us to explore this this really interesting kind of new new venture for for SBMT in the East Studio. And uh, once again, if you are still with us out there watching and you feel so inclined to to make a donation to to the company, uh, that would be greatly appreciated as as we work to uh, thriving in this in this. Uh, new world that we find ourselves in right now. Thanks again to everybody. Wish you all a good night and uh, hope to see you again soon. And again, I'll echo Diane's comments of just a thank you to Doug, Melissa, and Melinda, and Thomas, and Diane. Uh, we're grateful, we're appreciative. Again, if there is, if you are interested in more information, please feel free to email me or fill out that little form um, that I dropped into the chat. And that is just to gain interest. We ideally would love to put on some of these, some of the, the uh, pieces that we work on in that workshop. Um, so there is, there is life there too. Thank you guys so much. Have a great evening. And thank you all. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself and turn on your video and chat away if you wish. <laughs>